Young people from Braithy have been exploring the world for 40 years. They've sounded lakes, surveyed glaciers, ringed birds, collected plants, investigated historic sites, and measured just about everything. Many of the tasks undertaken by the group were suggested by those engaged in research in universities or the Nature Conservancy. For many years, Vaughan Lewis of Cambridge University Geography Department had been interested in the development of mountain scenery. It was in 1947, after discussions with Brian Ware on the need for detailed information about the depths of mountain towns in the Lake District, that the idea of the Braithy Exploration Group originated. The survey and sounding of these small lakes would provide vital information about the way in which glaciers once moved and eroded our landscape, information which until now had been hidden in the unknown depths of these tarns. Here was the challenge which fired the imagination of the first groups coming to Braithy. The objectives were clear to all. Achieving them involved camping in the mountains in all weathers and learning the rudiments of surveying. The element of real discovery inspired the best efforts of all and everyone shared in the achievement of producing the first chart of the lake. It was not long before the Braithy group extended their work overseas. Here's a sequence from one of the early expeditions to Norway in 1958. Again, the work is high up in the mountains, but this time the glaciers are for real. After a three-day journey from Britain by sea and mountain road, we were dumped with all our kit. Now the real work began. We had to carry all our personal gear and food and tents and other equipment up the steep mountain slopes to base camp. From base camp we moved on over the watershed and down onto the glacier beyond. This final stretch of the journey was not an easy one and to establish the advance camp we had to make quite a number of journeys with stores and equipment. To many people, the most exciting thing about a Braithy expedition is the introduction to a new environment. Although scenes like this are now commonplace to the viewer of television, at the time of the early expeditions, they were, to most people, quite new.
Back in Britain, the Exploration Group was pioneering fieldwork projects in one of our own remote regions, the Shetland Island of Fula, Britain's most isolated community. For 25 years, three or four groups visited the island each year, and a derelict croft house, rebuilt by the Braithy parties, served as a base. Again. Most of the work concerned the natural history of the island, with its towering cliffs and great seabird colonies. There was a long-term ringing program and close observation of the dominant species, the great skewer, the fulmer, and the storm petrel. As soon as you get anywhere near them, they sit on their legs and put the head back and spit up all sorts of fish, half-digested fish, and fulmer oil up at you. Deadly accurate. And you generally find that you get your anoraks and your trousers quite coated in the stuff. Meanwhile, a strong relationship developed between the island community of some 30 or 40 folk and the Braithy explorers, who helped them gather in their peat, the fuel of the island. At a time when the future of the island hung in the balance, the presence of the active, friendly young people for two months each summer was a great encouragement to them. This and many other forms of community service filled in the time between the fieldwork. Braithy's first experience of East Africa was in 1962, and through it they were able to expend their ideas of partnership. So far, the partnership had been between young people of different backgrounds, from schools and from industry. Now, Braithy was joining with young people from the country visited to explore and do fieldwork together. In our five weeks in Africa, we learned a great deal, not only about the geography of Uganda, we learned much about human relationships. It was not so much a matter of simply being with people of different backgrounds. The important thing was that we had worked with them and worked on equal terms. Going into the remoter parts of Uganda was as much an experience for the African schoolboys as it was for us but young people everywhere seemed to find ways of breaking down barriers. In this case, we all went in for a bit of fun with these bows and arrows, sold to the mad English to make fools of themselves in front of the experts. Greenland and Iceland have been regular venues for Braithy expeditions since 1953 and it is in Iceland that they established strong links with their scientists, leading to valuable projects in practical ecology and glaciology. Here is a glimpse of some of the survey techniques used on the 1968 expedition. The glacier survey was part of a national study of the changes in Iceland's glaciers over the years. We were on the third largest ice cap in the world. 
In the previous year, a Braithy expedition surveyed the snout, or lower section of Fatjokan, and their maps and photos were the starting point for our survey of the rest of this glacier. First of all, we set up marker points at key positions all along the valley. Once this was done, the points were accurately plotted using a theodolite. Another instrument is the quickset level, which is used to measure gentle slopes in conjunction with the staff. All this detail is recorded onto the plane table, and so the map of the glacier gradually takes shape. This is a method of mapping ideally suited to our needs, as it contains built-in checks for accuracy. The use of such method enables young explorers to play a full and active part in the project. The chief purpose of Braithy Expedition Films was to show others what could be achieved, to set a standard for them to follow. Here's what they had to say some years ago on the important subject of food. an expedition of this kind, high standards of cooking are essential, and these are based on considerable training beforehand. The foods chosen are light, have high food value, and are easy to prepare. Breakfast means opening most of these. Special expedition biscuits are used instead of bread and can be covered liberally with butter and jam. We generally start with porridge, even though it is not eaten much at home nowadays. It's a good foundation for the day, particularly if the weather is cold. Primer stoves are used for cooking. These are by far the most economical and powerful means of heating provided you understand fully how to use them. In 1975, Braithy moved into North America. A joint expedition with the newly formed Canadian Exploration Group set out to explore and survey the remote high spots of the Selkirk Mountains in British Columbia. By helicopter, you could do the journey to the High Mountains Base Camp in 10 minutes. But not everyone in our expedition went in by helicopter. Eight of us had to walk this valley. We opened up a trail to the top through Palmer Creek first visited by Howard Palmer in 1912 and untrodden for over 60 years. But whatever the hardships of the journey, the scenery and the companionship made up for it all. The things that matter on a walk like this are the basics. Water, fire and drying out your socks. Our food came mainly from lightweight dehydrated packs, easy to cook and very nutritious. This was bear country and so all food had to be packed away at night. We met bears at two camps and one tore open a food bag. Near the top, we saw a grizzly, but luckily at a safe distance.
This expedition, like all Braithy expeditions, was an enormous personal challenge. With the passing years, they may change the words through which they describe the experience. They may even change the approach. But underneath, the experience to each newcomer is just as valuable. Let's finish with the summing up of one of those early lake surveys. At Braithy Hall, it's an important part of every expedition to produce well-written reports on the fieldwork and really good maps. Some people will be judging the success of the expedition by the quality of the fieldwork that is produced. Others, no less wise, will judge it by the response of the members. For ten days they've lived together and worked together on an adventurous task that has called for the best in them. Brain and brawn were needed, but these alone were not enough. The expedition succeeded because of their cheerfulness, tolerance, determination, and more than anything else, because of their common interest in things outside themselves and greater than themselves.